Welcome to the Scientific Method and Other Methods of Rational Inquiry. This is the first video lesson in probability and statistics. Probability and statistics play a key role in different kinds of rational inquiry. Some examples include the scientific method, the SIAM modeling process, Deming's PDSA or Plan Do Study Act, or CRISP-DM, ASUMDM, and other data science methodologies. The scientific method is a multi-stage methodology for scientific inquiry. It begins by observing the occurrence of a natural phenomenon that is yet to be explained. Once a natural phenomenon is observed, you typically formulate a question about its nature, such as, why did this happen? Or is this phenomenon caused or influenced by some other phenomena that we already understand? With a question about the observation in mind, we typically devise at least two competing hypotheses that explain the nature of the observed phenomenon. Next, we deduce testable predictions from our hypotheses. We do this using logic, and ideally different hypotheses will result in different sets of predictions. The predictions ought to be falsifiable and that it should be possible to reject them should we encounter experimental evidence that contradicts them. If we have a testable, falsifiable prediction, we ought to be able to design and conduct an experiment to test that prediction. There's several methodologies for designing experiments. Fisher, Neyman and Pearson, Cochrane and Cox all have established commonly used methodologies. Once our experiment is complete, our task is to analyze data that stems from it. In doing this, we're not simply trying to contradict one or more of the predictions and thus reject the hypothesis that generated them, we're also trying to quantify the level of confidence we have in making these decisions. At this stage, it might be necessary to repeat the cycle of constructing hypotheses, deducing predictions, and designing and conducting more experiments, and even analyzing the data that come from them. Alternatively, if we've arrived at our conclusions with a sufficiently high degree of confidence, we can move on to the next stage in the scientific method. At that point, we would offer a general theory for publication and peer review. When we're doing scientific inquiry, it's incredibly easy to make mistakes and overlook details. So for this reason, we, we have to carefully journal the details of our work and offer it up to others in the process of peer review before eventual publication. Once the general theory is in place and generally accepted, it often shines light on new phenomena to be observed and a new cycle of the scientific method can begin again. So finally, it's important to understand that the scientific method is not a linear methodology. There's not a single sequence of steps that you follow. Most of the time, it's very much cyclic in nature. And the cycles that you follow can vary from observation to observation, because different observations are going to result in different phenomena with different levels of complexity. I'm going to illustrate the scientific method, or at least its individual stages, by example. So here's what observing a phenomenon might look like. Imagine several researchers in North America that have noticed, at least on a limited basis, that cottontail rabbit populations living in some of their study sites seem to consistently exhibit smaller numbers of tularemia infections than the populations found in the rest of their study sites. To the researchers, this is an unexplained phenomenon that warrants further study. A question our imaginary researchers might formulate then is, what could be causing some of the rabbit populations to appear to be experiencing fewer tularemia infections than others? They settle upon this as their research question. In order to construct a hypothesis, the researchers categorize their study sites into two categories, those with lower numbers of tularemia infections and those with higher numbers of tularemia infections on a per capita basis. They start considering the similarities within the categories and the differences across them. At some point, they notice the study sites with lower numbers of tularemia infections all seem to be located in regions with noticeably cooler climates than those study sites with the higher numbers of tularemia infections. This leads them to suggest their first tentative hypothesis, 
Rabbits living in colder climates will be less susceptible to tularemia infections. From this hypothesis, the researchers deduce a testable prediction. They reason that if rabbits living in colder climates will be less susceptible to tularemia infections, then it ought to be possible to consistently observe smaller numbers of infected rabbits among randomly selected samples of rabbits taken from populations in colder climates than what would be seen in similar samples taken from populations in warmer climates. So, the researchers set out to design and conduct an experiment to test their prediction. They proposed to collect random samples of 30 rabbits from 40 separate populations living in study sites with moderate climates. This results in the following data set, which represents the counts of infected rabbits within each of the 40 samples of 30. So as you see, there's 40 numbers here, and each of them, each number, represents the number of infected rabbits within that particular sample. After this, they collect random samples of 30 rabbits from four more separate populations, but this time they live in study sites with colder climates. This results in the following data set, which represents the counts of infected rabbits found within each of the four experimental samples of 30. The researchers have conducted their experiments and collected their data, and now they need to analyze them. So they're going to apply a statistical analysis in, term, in hopes of determining whether or not there are significantly fewer rabbits who are infected with tularemia in the four cold climate sites in comparison to what they found in the warmer climate sites. Based on their analysis, the researchers are able to determine that it is only 0.51% likely that they would ever collect a sample of 30 rabbits from a population living in a moderate climate and find three or fewer that are infected. Similarly, they are able to determine that it is 5.02% likely that they would ever collect a sample of 30 rabbits from a population living in a moderate climate and find five or fewer that are infected. Moreover, they are able to determine that it is only 0.102% likely that they would ever collect four samples of 30 rabbits from populations living in moderate climates and find an average number of infected rabbits equal to the average they found, which was four. It's important to note that these percentages or probabilities don't come out of nowhere. In fact, much of the effort that we're going to put into studying and learning probability and statistics will be pointed towards developing the techniques that these researchers would have used in order to compute these probabilities from the data that they collected. The previous examples represent a single idealized cycle of the scientific method painted in very broad strokes. In actual practice, the researchers depicted in these examples would probably have to test several different predictions they deduced from their hypothesis. They would also be well advised to replicate their experiments in order to ensure reproducibility. They might find that they encounter one or more null results that cause them to rethink and reformulate their hypothesis, which would in turn call for new predictions and new tests. After all this effort, the researchers might arrive at a publishable result. In that event, they would draft a scientific article that describes both their methodology and findings and submit it to a scientific journal where it would undergo the scrutiny of the peer review process before possibly being accepted for publication. As we get further in our study, we'll build up a simplified example of what this article might look like if the team of researchers chose to write it. The scientific method isn't the only methodology you could choose to follow when conducting rational inquiry. Consider mathematical modeling, for instance. When beginning a modeling effort, there's lots of different methodologies you could choose to follow. We're going to adopt a process called the modeling process developed by the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, or SIAM. Like the scientific method, the SIAM modeling process is a multi-stage cyclic process. It just applies to mathematical modeling. It begins with a stage in which you define the problem statement. 
real-world problems can be broad and complex, so it's important to refine the conceptual idea into a concise problem statement, which will indicate exactly what the output of your model is going to be. Next, you would typically make some modeling assumptions. Earlier in your work, it may seem that a problem is too complex to make any real progress. That's why it's necessary to make assumptions to help simplify the problem and sharpen your focus. During this process, you can reduce the number of factors affecting your model, thereby deciding which factors are the most important. Once you've made some modeling assumptions, it's time to define variables that would be used in your model. These are going to represent the primary factors influencing the phenomena that we're trying to understand. So we ought to be able to list these factors as quantifiable variables with specified units. We may need to distinguish between independent variables, dependent variables, and model parameters. In understanding these ideas better, we're going to be able to both define model inputs and create mathematical relationships, which ultimately establish the model itself. Our next most pressing task is to get a solution. We want to determine what we can learn from our model. Does it answer the questions that we've originally asked? Determining a solution may involve pencil and paper calculations, evaluating a function, running simulations, or even solving an equation, depending on the type of model that we've developed. It might be helpful to use software or some other kind of computational technology when performing this task. Simply obtaining a solution from a mathematical model really isn't sufficient in the overall modeling process. It's not the end goal any more than performing an experiment is the end goal in the scientific method. So we've got to step back and perform some analysis and some model assessment in order to analyze our results and assess the quality of our model. We want to know what the strengths and weaknesses of the model are. We want to know if there's any situations where the model doesn't work. We ought to be able to determine how sensitive the model is if we alter our assumptions or change model parameter values. We want to find out if it's possible to make possible improvements to our model. Once we've performed that analysis, it's worth reporting our results. It might be a great model, but if we aren't able to share it and explain it with others, it's not going to get used. So typically, we would write a modeling report and offer it up for peer review to the scientific community. However, this might be also a commercial model that we would offer up to sale for a private en entity. Just like we saw with the scientific method, the SIAM modeling process is highly nonlinear. At least it's got the potential to be. You'll often find yourself repeating stages or entire cycles of stages within the process until you've reached a level of refinement in your model and its potential results that you're satisfied with. This often occurs during the building of the model, um, but it can occur in other places as well. It's easy to imagine getting a solution and then analyzing that solution only to find new information that causes you to go back and make new assumptions about your model, redefine it, redefine variables, and essentially start all over before you ever get to the point where you're going to be satisfied enough to report the results of the model and share it for broader use with others. In order to see how the SIAM modeling process might look in practice, I'll propose an example. In the paper, Markovian Dynamics of Simple and Complex Desert Plant Communities, John McAuliffe proposed a model for the succession dynamics between three plant vegetation categories in certain desert plant communities. These communities included regions dominated by the shrub species, Lorea tridentata and Ambrosia dumosa, the perennial bunchgrass, Hilaria rigida, and bare ground. One way we could gain insight into how he might have begun to develop his models would be to imagine that he used the SIAM modeling process. Well, if that were the case, McAuliffe would have had to have identified and designed a real-world problem. In a particular desert plant community, there seems to be a progression in time of states in which a plot of land is dominated by shrubs or by grasses or perhaps even by nothing at all. The type of vegetation that dominates a landscape affects management decisions that are made for the landscape. 
These might be related to grazing, fire suppression, or erosion control. We want to make predictions about the vegetation types that dominate a landscape. Is there a steady state distribution of vegetation types that dominate this landscape? Can we predict the behavior of the different vegetation categories over time? There seems to be some sort of succession dynamics at play. If the landscape is dominated by a particular vegetation category, can we make a prediction about what is likely to dominate that landscape at a later date? Determining answers to these questions about vegetation succession dynamics constitute our real-world problem. Next, we would need to define some variables for our model. The three vegetation categories McAuliffe identified were shrubs, grasses, and bare ground. We will model the extent to which these categories dominate a landscape over time. Let x sub t serve as a variable that represents the category the landscape is dominated by at time t. We will use the encoding x sub t equals 1 to indicate that the patch of land is dominated by shrubs, or s, at time t, x sub t equals 2 to indicate that the landscape is dominated by grasses, or g, at time t, and x sub t equal 3 to indicate that the landscape is dominated by bare ground, or b, at time t. Now we'll make some assumptions about our model. After observing succession dynamics in the field, it seems reasonable to assume that if a landscape is currently dominated by a particular vegetation category, there is a fixed chance that the landscape will remain dominated by that category for a given time interval, a year for instance. We also assume there are fixed chances that the landscape will transition to being dominated by one of the other two categories. There's quite a bit of probability theory we must put into place before we can actually implement a model that adheres to these assumptions. But once we do, we will revisit this example and see how the SIAM modeling process continues to play out. We'll conclude this video lesson with a much briefer look at each of the remaining process models or methodologies for rational inquiry. The first of these is Deming's PDSA, or Plan Do Study Act. So in post-war Japan, and then later on in the U.S., William Edwards Deming carried out a great deal of consulting in the manufacturing industry with the aim of helping corporations to improve productivity and efficiency while maintaining a high degree of quality control. Deming devised a cyclic procedure for fostering improvement that he referred to as Plan Do Study Act, or PDSA. His work evolved from the similar but simpler cycle for improving industrial quality devised by Walter Schuert while at Bell Labs. Both process models are cyclic in nature, and both have a lot in common with the scientific method. We can see that Deming's name for the process model, Plan, Do, Study, Act, also defines the individual stages of the model. These stages represent a continuous cycle of observation and planning, experimentation, analysis, and then later on execution and deployment that ideally will result in quality improvement uh, in the manufacturing sector. It's essentially the scientific method applied to manufacturing. Rational inquiry also occurs in the field of data science. And with the popularity of internet and connectivity of both personal and private electronic devices, the late 20th century and beyond has seen an unprecedented amount of data collection. Much interest in the possibility of learning new and unseen information from that data has evolved. This practice is known as data mining, or more broadly, machine learning and it's its own form of inquiry. One of the more successful process models for conducting data mining efforts is known as the Cross-Industry Standard Process for Data Mining, or CRISP-DM. Like the scientific method and the SIAM modeling process, CRISP-DM is a cyclic process for modeling inquiry, 
However, it's more specific in that it focuses on assessing techniques for learning new information from large data sets with business or corporate interests in mind. So this figure illustrates the basic stages of CRISP-DM. Typically, we would want to have a strong business understanding of the need for learning something from our data, but we would also need to understand the nature of the data itself. In other words, what can be learned from it. From there, we would typically prepare our data, clean it, mollify it, make it ready for study, and then we'd develop one or more models with the intention of learning what we hope to learn from that data. We would evaluate those models for effectiveness, correctness, accuracy, speed, various other metrics, and then typically do one of two things. We're either going to deploy that model for widespread use, or we're going to go back to square one and revise it, revise the whole process because we've identified something is wrong during the evaluation stage. So we go back to business understanding and try again. Loosely speaking, you could interpret CRISP-DM as the scientific method applied to the process of data mining. CRISP-DM is still in use, but it no longer seems to be actively maintained. IBM has developed and released a similar model, the Analytics Solution Unified Method, that can be viewed as a generalization of CRISP-DM. The ASUMDM methodology can be seen to be cyclic in nature and retains an analysis component that allows for the rational assessment of a developing data science model. ASUMDM has the potential to lend itself to broader machine learning tasks as well as just data mining by itself. This becomes evident when looking at its model diagram. It's similar to CRISP-DM, but less focused on the business applications of data mining. And this brings us to the end of our first video lesson. Thank you for watching, and I hope you join us for our next one.